Um, in no particular order, we have Samuel Bouchard, who is CEO and co-founder of Canadian company Robotic, which builds applications for collaborative robots. We are also joined by John Glover, who is Managing Director of Machinery Safety and Risk Management Consultancy, Glover Associates and Consulting. Phil Scott, the Managing Director of the Filter Design Company will be joining us. And uh, the Filter Design Company has a mission to provide all with clean air. So in recent times, the company has been predominantly providing quality respiratory protection devices and filters for healthcare professionals. Uh, we also welcome Jeremy Haddle, who is a senior automation engineer and auditor and brings a wealth of experience developing automation systems across a range of industries. And last, but by no means least, we have Andrew Mason. Andrew has been part of the Barra Council since 2013 and is sales manager at at RAR UK Automation. So if we can get to our first question. <laughs> the first question that I'm going to pose is, can robots and automation systems be used to reduce occupational health and safety risks? And I think we'll take that question to Sam first, please. Yeah, well, hopefully the answer is yes. If not, it's gonna be a very short discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely we, we see many companies. So uh, many of, uh, of the customers that we serve globally, including some in the UK, definitely use automation to reduce uh, some of the risk. Uh, a little story behind the company. It started with a, a hand, a robotic hand technology, and part of it had been developed for the UK Atomic Energy Authority back in the day. So the very uh, genesis of the company was coming from safety. Uh, why we send people to do uh, difficult jobs or jobs that are dangerous is because flexibility. And nowadays the technology is there. So there's enough flexibility and enough uh, ease of use. So definitely we can, we can do this. And uh, usually there are some benefits to the health and safety, but these benefits never come along. There are usually other uh, benefits that's come, that come uh, associated to this as well. So it's usually a combination of these different factors to justify purchasing of these equipment. Great, thanks, Sam. And can I pose the same question to John, please? Can robot and automation systems be used to reduce occupational health and safety risks? I think you're on mute still, John. My apologies. Um, so I better. Yes, can he now? Yes, there was a, a, an interesting study by the, the health and safety executive. Uh, I think it was about um, back in 2007, 2008, and it was on an average company employing 500 people. This study was done over several different industries. Uh, for example, the steel industry is much more risky, if you like, than the electronics industry. So it was over a number of different industries. And for a company on average uh, employing 500 people, uh, they, they, they had a breakdown on the number of injuries per year, which on average was 15. There was a cost associated to that. And uh, there was a number of first aids and a number um, of uh, instances where there was uh, damages to equipment. And the net cost, uh, the health and safety executive came up with at that time was, um, it was costing a company that employ on average 500 people, £134,000 per year. Now, when you now take that, uh, you take that to the figures for 2021 and uh, build in inflation, that's almost £200,000 in today's money. That simply means that uh, a company, if a company is making 10% net profits, then they need to produce two million pounds worth of goods just to pay for that. So the more automation that we have, the more robots that we have and collaborative robots, then very simply less injuries because robots don't get injured and they don't get diseases and they don't pass them on. Do you find as um, 
sort of going out and talking to your potential customers, do you find that they're surprised about the uh, potential savings that can be made like that? Or is it something that they are already aware of? Uh, the majority of them, Charlotte, um, in our experience, are surprised, mm -hmm. very surprised. Uh, there, there is, a, in general terms, in British industry, uh, in the boardroom, the majority of people or company directors are coming from finance backgrounds. They're not, they're not enough people on the boards of um, large organisations. It's either coming from an engineering background or a safety background. So I think that's one of the problems. Yeah, I think we still have a long way to go in terms of education. Yeah. Um, and over to you, Phil. Um, this, the, the same point again about um, can robot and automation systems be used to reduce occupational health and safety risks? Um, obviously, you, you're coming at this from a slightly different point of view as a kind of manufacturer, designer, um, rather than provider of automation systems. Uh, well, we actually do provide of automation systems oh. as well. So that's part of the business uh, and that's what we're approved to do or licensed to do. But uh, yeah, we, we put a lot of um, uh, small robotic cells in place. Um, we identified probably about five or six years ago once uh, RRR became on stream uh, and the cost benefits of replacing some of the uh, more manual uh, processes on site that could um, potentially uh, be de risk by using robot robots. Um, and we've probably put in probably over the last 12 months, probably something in excess of three robots that take away the need, the interface between what could be potentially a, a risky operation with hot melts and adhesives and things like that, and actually use them to interface with the um, with the machinery, but also the operator, so that we get more consistent and safe handling of the product. Uh, and uh, I think that's had a benefit. And the positive of the whole thing is that our automation, by automating ourselves, uh, we actually get more uh, output per hod, per head of uh, every employee that we employ. So less risky, safer to use, and also it, it finances itself by more outputs. Mm -hmm. and, and and what about, sorry, and, and what about acceptance by the staff? Um, has, it, has it generally been very positive? Yeah, we've had no, um, you know, we've been in operations now for probably 16 years. Um, we have a good core uh, 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 staff buildup. We don't have a high uh, turnover in staff. Um, but I think uh, they respect everything that we do in terms of health and safety. Health and safety is the brand that we go to. We have a, a weekly meeting at which I chair and every member, well, until COVID arrived, of course, I stand at the front and do a presentation uh, on the performance of the business on a weekly basis. And the first thing we report is health and safety instances and uh, any issues that may or may not arise in the factory. Uh, not just robotics, but anything to do with health and safety. So I think there's a big buy-in from the company and its staff to actually um, make sure that when they come to work, they go home with no, no issues. And introducing robots has now been seen as a way of doing that um, and also increases productivity as well, which is, the, uh, which is another plus benefit of introducing cells like that. Great, thank you. Okay, so moving on, well, it's, it's related, obviously. Um, I'm get, now going to ask uh, about typical examples of robot applications that are justified mainly in terms of health and safety. I mean, obviously, um, from, from what people are saying now, it's not just health and safety, um, but then, um, this, that's what we're here to talk about. So um, if I can ask Jeremy, if you'd like to comment about the typical examples of robot, robot applications for health and safety. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, th I think the interesting thing when we talk about using robots for health and so to, to, to take people away from dangerous or, or, or potentially dangerous situations, it's interesting to think that the original reason for having robots was what we termed as the three Ds, the dull, the dirty, and the dangerous tasks. And 
I guess we're, we're what are we, 60, 70 years on since the first uh, real robot being put into a car plant, 70, uh, sorry, 40, 50 years from the first microprocessor controlled robot. And those three things haven't really changed. So really, when you're talking about where you can see these robots that you, you justify mostly on health and safety terms, you're talking about dangerous tasks. You're talking about things that could be hot or you're dealing with um, uh, spinning uh, cutting tools or, or things like that. You're thinking about um, where you've got hazardous materials in the environment, um, whether they be chemicals, nuclear products, um, foundries, are, you know, they're not particularly a nice place to, to work day in, day out. Um, and when you're doing heavy lifting and you're doing that heavy lifting over and over again, that repetitive um, heavy lifting, particularly when you're trying to lift big boxes beyond your, your kind of uh, your, your waist. So th those dull, those dirty, those dangerous tasks are, uh, are really the places where you're going to see robots be justified just on health and safety terms. I think there's another thing that, that I was going to chip in on the previous question is, is we often talk about the kind of mechanical injury to, to humans. But there's also this mental injury to humans as well about trying to keep up with the production line. And I, I, I stumbled across this because I, I just stumbled across um, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times and the little sketch where he's kind of dragged into the machine where he's trying to keep up with the production line. And it, and it kind of dawned on me, well, actually, that's quite a stressful task to just try and keep up with that production line. And it's something that we have, we probably should start thinking about with, with people in work in, in factories and where robots can actually step in and go, well, okay, I can keep up with that production line and you don't have that stress. Thanks. Sam, have you got any comments on this area? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, uh, Jeremy, let's talk about uh, the mental stress. Uh, the way we do the work today in factories is really uh, the result of the industrial revolution. So we split this in, in some tasks and, and now we have to keep the pace with the rest of the, of the machines. And where we still have humans is because we, we still need flexibility or we didn't manage to, uh, to automate them. And the, the dull is still there, the dirty and dangerous is still there. Uh, the type of use case where we see robots being used to uh, improve the, the safety, the physical safety is really uh, everything related to movement. So talking about movement that are repetitive, uh, lifting some uh, heavy boxes and doing some uh, torsional movement, for instance. Uh, things that really work are always the same movement at the wrist level, potentially. So that also happened, obviously, feeding parts into dangerous machines. Uh, so that's more the mechanical aspect. And then there's everything related to more the, the envir environmental hazard that come from the process itself. So maybe some de debris being blown off, uh, some dust, some chemicals, etc. That's another area. And, uh, and now we need to, to balance what is the challenge of doing these tasks because when the robot is doing the actual process, it's usually a little bit more complicated, but definitely in terms of handling parts safely, um, there's a big gains there for potentially uh, smaller investment uh, as well. And in the end, obviously we, we want safety, but the, the core challenge is, is the people challenge just in general, because it is very difficult as all of you know, to find the people, to keep the people uh, in the factories and what we want to do is we want to augment their capacity and sometimes definitely there is a very dangerous task that should be done by a machine and we can do that sometimes the task is just slightly dangerous the risk is not that high but com this combined with the challenge of finding keeping our people it really makes a lot of sense to put a robot there so that person can do something else where uh, she can bring more value he or she can bring more value and also Charlotte tying this to your previous question of perception is very interesting when you talk to customers, the change in perception is, is dramatic usually between before the first robot and after the first robot from the operators. Um, robots look a little bit like humans, so people see this and they say, hey, is it uh, going to, to steal my job? The reality is as soon as the first robot is installed, the, the dynamic change, uh, it, it really flips and people start looking for opportunities because they realize that the robot is taking that, dirt, that dull or that dangerous task and now they really see this as a, as a big as a way to really improve their quality of life at work. Oh, that's really interesting. So it's it's actually um, people on the shop floor that are driving the different applications as well as the management. Definitely. After the first install, we see this everywhere. And if you look at the different stories that, uh, that we film after people install, that's always the same message. And they usually give nickname to the first robot and then they, yeah. uh, it, it becomes a, a work buddy that they're very happy to, uh, to work with. And then they, they really have the eyes open for the next opportunity on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And um, over to John. Um, so 
um, yeah, again, typical examples of robot applications justified mainly in terms of health and safety. Well, we, we deal in uh, high risk areas such as um, flammable atmospheres or where you can have um, dust clouds, which can be explosive. Uh, and that's a typical uh, scenario where you can have a, a, a robot or, or a collaborative robot. But you've also got end of line packaging where you have not, not so much heavy lifting, but it's repetitive tasks. Uh, and this is where you can have lots of, uh, I suppose you can call it musculoskeletal injuries. And that's, that's, a, that's a big cause of illnesses uh, at work. But in terms of focusing company minds, companies' minds or, or directors' minds at the minute, is, uh, there are two reasons. First of all, is Brexit. Now, there are possible uh, or there has been supply disruptions so that's a concern. But there's also been a labour pool concern. The Office of National Statistics had a report about two months ago where in 2020, there was a reduction in the UK labour pool from non-UK nationals of 700,000 people. And that very simply has got to be filled either with inexperienced workers, which can cause injuries at work, or it's a gap that has to be filled by collaborative robots, possibly, or even industrial robots. And in terms of the, the pandemic, we've all found uh, manufacturers who have adapted absolutely terrifically well to the pandemic. They have to meet their production, production targets. They have to meet their output. They've had to implement social distancing measures. And in some cases, I've had to. Uh, adapt or implement new shift patterns. Uh, again, a, a possibility is that um, this is an area that can be filled again with uh, industrial robots as well as collaborative robots. Okay, thank you. Um, as well, uh, same kind of question to Andrew. I know that um, I've seen some applications from um, RAR UK that might fit in with this. Yes, well, for the first time I, um, well, one of the first times I met with Phil and we worked together, um, that was an application that, that um, Phil was keen to um, resolve and he's already touched on it. It was um, a, a, an application where filter was being fitted into a housing um, with glue and the operator was using a glue gun uh, so there was a, there was a hand operated glue gun um, and the um, potential for RSI that was one of the drivers I believe Phil tell me in a minute if I'm wrong but I think the, the other benefits were that in the past I think glue was getting where it didn't need to be so the waste of glue um, Glue was not necessarily getting everywhere, so it, the seal was not made. And uh, the benefit of RSI um, of being eliminated, it was a, an all round uh, benefit. And also, I think Phil said earlier, the, uh, the, uh, the productivity increased as well. So it's just one example of, of an easy win. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was one of our first with, with Phil. Do you want to come in there, Phil, and expand on that? Yeah, it was our first uh, um, our first use of uh, collaborative robots on site. It was a simple um, cell that we looked at. And Andrew's right, the, uh, my main concern at the time was the RSI risk, uh, the continuous use of lifting uh, nearly a kilo's worth of handgun and move it through repetitively through certain angles on a continuous basis. So the, the use of collaborative robots to do that job did do uh, a lot of things. It improved the, um, the output, which is one thing, but one of the main benefits, we did, it reduced the reject rates um, because obviously the, the, the way we manufacture filters, we manufacture high-end filters. And every filter goes through a testing protocol before it leaves the factory to measure the penetration through the filter. And uh, our reject rate came down. And uh, even though 
it's it's still about one percent in terms of what we manufacture it might sound heavy in a lot of industries believe you me if you're not testing filters there's not a thing on this planet that'll get your reject rates down consistently below one or two percent and that's why we always test every filter that goes through it so accuracy rsi and health and safety were the three things that drove that uh, the first introduction of that uh, robotic cell and we've done that across the board now where all those glue guns now are all uh, converted to uh, robotic cells uh, and we're moving across now to more automation of uh, robotics in terms of testing and uh, and going into more areas that we don't really want operators interfacing, inter interfacing with um, and we do have a lot of applications that we put in place for very fast automation of testing of filters for the like for large vacuum cleaner companies as well which have um, which have um, been sold uh, so all in all um, everything that we manufacture on site here has a weight load of no more than 600 grams and small collaborative robots are an ideal solution to move very small products around up to three kilos very accurately precisely um, and we moved i think i don't know how many we bought of you andrew it must be a few by now but it I suspect we've probably bought in excess of, uh, in, well, into double digits in terms of robotics now. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for the next one to come, Phil. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because um, collaborative robots are, have been the buzz in the robotics sector for, for quite a number of years now. But um, at the beginning, I remember going to launches as, as a journalist and talking to people from um, the companies that were manufacturing the cobots. And, and, and they were saying, yeah, everyone's talking about it, but they're not really doing much with it. But now, recently, over the last few years, and especially with the pandemic, it just seems that, that, that the use of cobots is exploding. People are, are just, you know, as, as we said before about... Um, uh, people on the shop floor driving the uh, take up of, of robots. Um, it, the, once companies have one, they see lots more applications that they could be used for. So going to move on slightly. Well, uh, again, this is a bit of an overlap to what we've been talking about to um, ask which sectors can benefit most from adopting more robotics and automation to complete dirty, dangerous tasks and applications in environmentally challenging areas. Um, I think we'll take that to Sam again, please. Yeah, so the, there are many uh, industries because the, the, it really comes down to the task. So we talked about repetitive tasks, about heavy loads, about en environmental hazards. Uh, maybe just to give an example, obviously, the bigger the company, the bigger the uh, character. Uh, I was on, uh, on a call the other day with a multinational uh, engine company, and they, they presented their ergonomic prices. So they, they had eight prizes of how they improve ergonomics uh, throughout different factories in different areas of the world. And two of these uh, winners were based on uh, robots. Um, so again, these big companies, especially those ones that have, uh, they had heavy uh, goods to manufacture, they have a lot of employees. So there's a lot of potential there and there's a big, big potential uh, scaling factor, but we also see it at, at very, uh, at, at a much smaller scales. So it's, it's not about any industry or type of company, it's more, what are the tasks that uh, that you're doing? Um, and I would be curious, and I want to, to derail the question, Charlotte, but I, I would be curious because Phil, you said that there's always an aspect of health and safety now in the different projects that you do. And John mentioned earlier that sometimes it's some people don't use this as a justification in, in when they want to, uh, when they decide to, uh, to buy a robot. Do you now include this in your financial analysis when you, uh, when you, say if it's a go or no go on a project? We don't do that deliberately. We just recognize that as an attribute of actually automating. Yeah. Uh, we're a fairly small company and the decision-making process is fairly flat in terms of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there is always a benefit in terms of anything we do, not just 
in terms of output, but also ensuring the operators are kept safe. Uh, uh, and it's not just robotics in terms of automation. There's lots of other automation cells that we do produce, but uh, the use of light guarding systems and things like that has come on no end over the last sort of five years. The cost return in terms of putting things like that into place are now a lot easier. They're easier to justify. And I think robotic cells, if you look at them, instead of going um, looking at the whole process, if you break it down into small uh, achievable steps in terms of automating something, the gain on the investment is a lot faster. And if you can factor in the health and safety side of it as well, as you produce, then it has a better buy-in into the factories that you, you deliver the automation to. Uh, and that's essentially what we do. We have no, we have no pushback in our factory. And when we do deliver up automation cells to other businesses, um, we always sell it on a health and safety uh, banner anyway, uh, because generally the processes that are currently being carried out do have a risk associated with them. And we try and de-risk everything in terms of what we do when we provide an automation solution. Okay, thanks for that, Phil. Um, I'm just going to circle back to collaborative robots because uh, while we've been chatting away, um, it has been pointed out that it would be a good idea if we could just kind of outline the difference um, between a conventional industrial robot and a collaborative robot. I think that um, I'm so used to talking about them, I just presume that everyone knows. Um, so I, I don't know whether, do you want to take this on, Jeremy? Um, yeah, I'll, I can try and shed some light onto this one. Um, so, firstly, um, let, let's just, just, just distill a myth. Um, most robots, in fact, all robots, are in some way collaborative, and the ISO standard um, actually allows for that in certain ways. Now, um, and in, what we call a standard industrial robot typically sits within a safety fence. And if a human, and that's to keep, that's not to keep the robot in, because most likely, um, you know, if, if, the, if the fence is really close to the robot, these robots are so big, they'll just smash straight through the fence. It's really to keep the operator away from the robot. And a standard industrial robot cell in that kind of environment will stop if uh, the safety guarding is broken or if somebody moves into that safety cell. Um, but you can collaborate with it. You can actually get the robot to slow down if you move into that work environment and operate at what we call a safe speed. Um, and if you get still get too close to the robot, it will eventually stop or you may be collaborating it in what we call the hand guided mode where you're using the teach pen and that's the control that the, the unit we use to teach the robots or program the robots. Um, and indeed, in some instances, the robot may be handing off to a human in a, in a safe mode. Now this collaborative robot um, idea came in about, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, where we started to see robots coming out that had very certain design features. Um, those design features was sort of lightweight construction, um, smooth rounded edges if you look, look at a kind of typical industrial robot they're quite they're quite bulky heavy machines they're not really designed to uh, to to be not next to someone but the collaborative robots tend to be much smoother much more rounded um, they're fitted generally with sensor systems inside them um, which measure the force and control the torque on the motors to what is to, to what we call known or safe uh, limits now the, the the kind of catch with that is what's safe for me is not necessarily what's safe for somebody else in terms of being hit on the arm by a robot, whether that's an accidental collision or not. So there's a little bit of a uh, of grayness there. And I'm sure John can jump in and, and, and kind of add more to that as we discuss it. But the key thing about these collaborative robots is they are tend they do tend to be smaller. They do tend to be uh, limited in their payload. Um, although that payload is, is going up all the time as we get new sensors and new uh, control systems. Um, but they do also tend to be limited in their speed. So they don't travel as fast as some of the bigger, more heavy industrial robots that we would naturally put behind a safety guarding because they are so fast and so dangerous. Um, and, and these collaborative robots, um, or what we call cobots, short, sorry, um, they, they, as I say, they, they have their force and torque limited. They detect uh, collision. They are controlled so that if there is a, so their motion shouldn't exert so much force. 
um, and they offer a different way of being able to collaborate with robots. And you can get what we, what we tend to call true collaboration, where humans and robots are working next to each other, whereas typically we put robots in a cage and stay away from them. So hopefully that's kind of explained the difference between the two. Did you have anything else to add there, Andrew? Yeah, so I was going to just, just to really to add that I think it's all about application and everything's about application. So the, 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 the type of robot, I, what, what throughput you need, the payload, etc. So it's not all applications are suitable for collaborative robots, but some are. So it's all about assessing what the end goals are. And, and then making a, 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 a selection based on that. Um, but one thing I would say about the collaborative robots is that they have certainly introduced automation to companies who had never considered it before. And so we, we see companies who may take their first step into automation by purchasing a, a collaborative robot. And then that opens their eyes to other applications, which may need an industrial robot uh, or a full system. So it, the, the introduction of them has, has really opened up people's eyes and, and I think that's been a whole benefit to industry. Absolutely. Um, John, did you have anything to add? I think that's uh, more or less answered that question there very well, Charlotte. Uh, just one thing I would uh, pick up on what uh, Andrew said there. Um, it, it depends very much on application and the objectives of uh, what a company wants to achieve. Um, this is a bit that people forget at times. And if you look at the, the design standard safety of machinery, ISO 12100, if you look at the flow chart in that, before you look at hazards and associated risks and control measures, you look at the limits of the machine, you look at what you want to achieve, and then you build safety on the back of that. Otherwise, you could finish up with a machine that's pretty safe, but you don't meet your production targets, which then means there could be a tendency to override the safety device, for example. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so coming back to um, challenging environments, um, Jeremy, uh, which sectors can benefit most from adopting more robots and automation? I I, I think it's it's not necessarily the section. I think I think this has already been alluded to. It's necess, It's more the application, because mm -hmm. I think you, you, in in most industrial sectors you'll find applications where, in reality, it's not a place you want to be putting a human for a long long term, um, for a long term. And um, you know whether that's that's because it's a dangerous environment. You know, there's chemicals, there's there's radiological hazards, or whatever it might be. Um, or whether it's dangerous because you've got uh, the process it's dangerous itself you know if, it, if it's um you know when, when i started in, in this industry 20 something odd years ago we didn't really think twice about putting a welding cell together and 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 really worry about the high, the high frequency uh emissions from that welding cell now we have to really worry about it because it, it is we now know that it's starting to cause people problems so, so there's, there's, there's all these things that in terms of the application that could drive you into wanting to use a robot for health and safety reasons. Um, yeah, there are certain industries where it's going to be more prevalent, like say, chemical, nuclear, um, farming, perhaps, uh, you know, farming is one of the highest instances of uh, uh, injuries and deaths in, in the UK, uh, the food and drink industry, um, certainly from the end of line packaging, as John's already said about the repetitiveness of picking things up and moving around, but also around contamination of products. And that could be really important in terms of pharmaceuticals as well. Um, mining could be an area where we want to see lots of robots, but it, it, I think it really comes down to the application. So even in some pretty benign or benign looking sectors, there could be applications where actually having a robot is the right thing to do from a health and safety point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen um, some horrible accident reports of um, uh, uh, injuries that have happened um, in kind of mixed environments, particularly in warehouses, where you've got someone on a forklift truck 
and a pedestrian and um, they've collided and it's just been awful. So, you know, the use of um, AGVs could solve that issue almost overnight. Forklifts are horrendous. Just let's leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so who have we not been to on this one? Uh, Phil, do you have any comments about the particular um, environment? You're on mute, Phil. Yeah, the one thing we don't tend to deal in hazardous environments, uh, but one thing that does, we do work a lot of work in the military sector and also in the pharmaceutical areas and robotics in terms of glove box operations in the pharmaceutical um, arena does make sense to me. Um, uh, you know, we're all victims of what happened over in China, whether it be a wet market or a laboratory. But having uh, robotics doing routine testing in, in unsafe uh, environments does make a lot of sense to me. And also in the military sector, ro robots are being moved across. We've already got drones and things like that. But manual handling of certain munitions and things like that spring to mind and robotizing the, uh, the, some of the, uh, the deployments of uh, that kind of uh, stuff is something that springs to mind in terms of hazardous, dangerous areas that robotics would suit and serve it well. Okay, well, that brings us very nicely onto the next point, which is, um, do we think we'll see new opportunities for automation to exist within new areas? For example, healthcare and emergency services. Um, Sam, would you like to come in on this one? Yeah, we're already seeing this and the starting point is really the industries that are adjacent to manufacturing. So you talked about distribution center. So definitely that side of the industry is booming. There's been several uh, companies uh, being acquired recently and there's a lot of activity obviously driven by the boom in e-commerce that we're seeing that was already on the rise and that just boomed even more with the pandemic. So definitely, so it's kind of adjacent in terms of what the technology needs to do and it's not that far. So that's really where we're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing, seeing a lot of uh, lab automation uh, also happening. Uh, so these are probably the areas where we see the, the, next, uh, the next thing happening uh, recently. And in the longer term, uh, in the more challenging environment where, yes, there's a need for uh, solving some safety issues. We talked about farming earlier, but the technical challenge because of the unstructured nature of the environment is much more challenging. So it may take a little bit more, a little bit more time for the robotics industry to get there in, uh, in a cost-effective manner. Yeah, yeah, I saw a really interesting um, story actually about um, the fire at Notre Dame Cathedral a couple of years ago, there was a devastating fire and the French fire brigade, I'm pretty certain sent in some kind of automated unit to um, figure out where the hotspots were before sending their, um, their firemen in. Um, so yeah, obviously we can see that that's happening already, uh, that the technology is moving out into other areas. Um, I was wondering, John, whether that's had a knock-on effect in the type of customer that is coming to you for your services, um, kind of on the uh, safety risk assessment side. I think you're on mute still. My apologies. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, I think I think this is going to change over time as well because. Um, Interestingly, the, the minute uh, manufacturing is 17% of GDP in, in the, U, the UK, and that very simply has to grow. It's been declining for, for decades now. And uh, there are all sort of incentives that's likely to come from government. There was one announced a couple of weeks ago um, to encourage manufacturing in the UK. Uh, and I think the, the type of uh, sectors that may well grow and come to the forefront, that could be looking for more robotic machinery, could be the likes of medical, where you have uh, drug manufacturers. And the drug manufacturers, uh, they tend to produce dust. So if you're producing dust and you get a dust cloud, then that's a, a potentially explosive um, and very dangerous um, atmosphere. So that's, uh, that's certainly one area. Other uh, possible areas of growth is going to be uh, battery manufacturers. So we're finding that at the minute. And uh, one that you mentioned there, Charlotte, is um, 
warehousing. Warehousing is potentially very dangerous. Uh, working at height, lifting heavy objects and uh, collision. So yeah, we, we see, we've seen a difference the past, I would say 12 to 18 months. And how about you, Andrew? Has that been the same? Yes, yeah, so I'd echo what John just said. Um, we're seeing the logistics side, you know, warehousing, um, you know, reducing or not not going to height to get get the products, but the height the product coming to the to, to the person, um, and also automated uh, fork trucks and AGVs and AMRs. Uh, 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 there's an increase in interest. So I think compared to the, the, the where robots are sold, I think logistics is actually now catching up and, and there is a, a bigger, bigger interest and bigger demand and certainly opportunities, I think. Yeah, I, I think potentially as unfortunately, um, things aren't looking quite so good for the automotive sector in the UK, which obviously used to be the biggest or still is one of the biggest um, sectors for using robotics and automation. Um, it, it's going to be in the other sectors that we, that we see the most growth and the most interesting applications, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, same, same thing to you, Jeremy, about um, different um, areas, for example, healthcare, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think, I think previous speakers have, have touched on healthcare and, and emergency services and logistics of farming they're all key areas and, and i think you're right charlotte the automotive for a long time has been leading the way in terms of the, the use of robotics um and it probably will be for a long time um but regardless of you know, whatever happens and john's picked up on it already I mean, the, the move to evs and the creation of these batteries that's going to require a, 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 not only a new supply chain but a completely new manufacturing philosophy for making these batteries at volume um, and, and a lot of these batteries are things that are almost easier to, to put together than a, than a traditional combustion engine, which needs a, an element of human kind of fiddling to put things together, if you like, in, in you know, the technical term there, fiddling to, to assemble something. Um, I, I think farming is a really big one. I th uh, that, that's, we've gone from having, um, I forget the numbers, but in the, in the mid 18th, mid 17th century, we had something like 60% of the, of the population were farming. We're now down at two or 3% and that's re reducing all the time. Um, but we need to feed as many people, if not more people, but we also need to feed uh, those people with less, in a less resource um, intensive manner. So we, we've got to find a way of, of rethinking farming and, and automation could be a, a role in that, robotics could be a role in that rather. I think there's a big uh, opportunity in terms of um, environmental cleanup um, and, and the use of robotics in that kind of area. So, um, you know, going out onto oceans and using robots of some type to sort all the plastic waste out of the oceans. Um, there was a there's been a LinkedIn post going around of a, of a, of a yacht that's being designed that will suck up uh, waste out of the ocean, but then it's got two or three people in the back of it sorting all that waste out. Well, that's not gonna be a particularly nice thing to do. So why can't we put a robot in there doing that task? So I think there are the, I think if, we, if the robot industry and people working around the robot industry start to look up or beyond their normal kind of automotive end of line packaging, the, the, the traditional industries and start looking up and saying, well, what else is there? We'll, we'll suddenly find huge amount of new opportunities for robots in areas where traditionally we haven't wanted to put people but have had to put people for health and safety reasons. And do you think that um, technologies, I'm thinking of, of, well, potentially AI and vision vision technologies, do you think that, that um, the way that they are developing is, is aiding this as well? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think they will do. I, the great thing about AI at the moment is we're not, we're never, we're not quite sure if it's going to be this thing that completely renders human beings as you know irrelevant and it's going to take over the world you know the rise of the robots if you want or whether it's going to be somewhere something like well it's clever but we still need to program it all and so what's the point 
we mm. don't quite know that with AI, but it's going to be somewhere in between and it's going to have a major effect on the way we program and use robots and the same with vision systems. We're already seeing vision systems that are able to pick up you know, different types of uh, materials in, in, in a big pile and be able to sort out um, all kinds of different things. So yeah, I think as those technologies become more um, robust and develop the ability of the robot, which essentially is just the arm, it's just it's just this thing here, really, that's all it is, um, is going to be able to do a lot more. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, again, we've touched on this already, but it's kind of difficult to um, tell what people are going to talk about when you're planning the questions. So uh, we talk um, here, I'm going to ask what are the cost benefits of improved health and safety? What factors contribute? And are these enough in their own right to justify the investment? Um, we take that to Andrew, I think, please. Okay, well, um, I think we, as we already sort of touched on, um, I don't think cost benefits are always the first thing that people think about when they're looking at the uh, uh, um, introducing robot sales. But where, where are the benefits? Um, ultimately, it's, if, if things go really wrong, the real cost is the person that gets injured or killed. Potentially big fines to uh, companies, and certainly in the UK, there's potential for uh, loss of liability, um, liberty to um, the, the the owners or directors of companies. So th there's a there's a big cost there. It depends how you how you how you, how you uh, view it. But I I was sort of thinking also about some of the softer benefits, and um, Phil touched on this earlier. He said that. Um, the, the retention of staff in his company is high. And I think companies who, who, who invest in technology to make a better work environment and, and safety, they, the employees see this, it helps to retain employees and it also helps to attract because you're taking it seriously. Um, another point I was, I was thinking about is that many bigger companies um, will publish days since we last had our accident. Um, so I'm just going to the factory and it was have a, a board up telling you this. And I'm thinking that that's some, maybe they're probably already doing this, but they could probably use that to leverage the insurance companies. If you've, if you've got a good record, you're less of a liability, you should be able to get some financial benefit there. So um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a few opportunities and people probably when they're, they're designing a cell, that's not their first thought, but they're, they're, it can be justified. Okay, um, John, did you want to come in here at all? Um, yes, I would. Um, I would add that uh, the um, the the biggest single influence in our legislation in the UK uh, since 1974 was implemented five years ago this this month with the new sentencing guidelines. Now, what that effectively meant was that. Companies that were uh, guilty of health and safety offences were meant to economically feel the pain in terms of a fine when being prosecuted. And since that was implemented, there were more fines in the, the next two years. So between 2016 and 2018, there were more £1 million fines than the previous 20 years. So it's quite an impact on an organization. One thing to consider is that when a company is fined, so if they're prosecuted, for example, under statutory law, like, uh, like the Health and Safety Work Act, they're not insured for that. They're not insured for that. So that can only come from one place. That's company reserves, if they have any. In terms of a civil claim, uh, every company is insured for employer's liability insurance of five or more people. But if an individual is injured at work, they've got three years to put a claim in. And whatever that uh, value is, let's say it's £5,000, what we should remember is that that's really the direct costs. There are indirect costs that we have to consider when organisations have been fined at work and they've had to compensate an individual. 
And what research tells is it could be anywhere between 10, 15 to 20 times your direct costs. So what that means on top of an uninsured uh, prosecution, whatever that figure might be, if a company then has to pay out compensation, then that's paid out and they're insured for that. Of course, their premiums in subsequent years will be much higher because they are deemed to be higher risk to the insurance company. But there's so much indirect cost behind that. So if that fine or that compensation payout, sorry, was maybe £2,000, it could well be the indirect cost behind that could be £20,000, £25,000 or so. So it's, it's certainly worth thinking about. Good health and safety is good business. Absolutely. Um, Sam, what are your feelings about whether health and safety is, is enough to justify the investment on its own? Usually what we're seeing, it's, it's really used in combination uh, with other things. But again, it's, it's more the, the people factor that's really front and center in those decisions as much as the financial. So early in the days of robotics, it was all about uh, being more productive and reducing headcount. The reality is today manufacturers, they have a hard time finding the headcount they need to keep operating. And with COVID, what happened is some companies, the, the demand for their goods decreased, some others, it, it increased. And that challenge, it was there before COVID. It's, it's there now and it's gonna be there in the future. That's just the demography and the fact that people don't wanna do these repetitive tasks. So even though the health and safety may be not the primary reason, it's about uh, augmenting your people, having them to be able to do more, more fulfilling work, get, do more value add the task. And uh, I, I would just second John's uh, statement that uh, good, health, uh, good health and safety is good business on this front because it, it really helps mobilize the people and have them bring more value to the business as well. Okay, thanks. So um, along the same lines again, um, Andrew, I'd like to ask you about financial incentives available uh, for, cost, uh, for companies if they want to um, introduce automation to reduce health and safety risks. I mean, I mean, is there any financial help available? Well, the, the, the most recent uh, uh, budget uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I think there's there's a further announcement that's going to be made. Um, there's the 23rd, I think it's next week, is tax tax day in UK, which, which will apparently is going to bring in some more announcements, but. Um, they introduced a 130% um, super deduction on capital allowance in the last budget. So um, against profit, you can you've got a, 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 a allowance, capital allowance. So um, if you invest, that can be offset um, against your tax liability. Um, and also, if you don't make that that, that benefit in the first first year. Um, it could be offset against losses can be carried forward. So you can use that, that tax benefit there. Um, there are also um, I know R and D um, tax allowances. So maybe one tax allowance for, for actually buying capital equipment to offset your liability, but also if you need to employ um, some new technicians to carry out some development work in your in your factory to to um to get the product up and running or the project up and running that can also be considered as, as an r&d benefit and therefore there's a tax there's a tax uh, uh, option there there are companies and i certainly know ppma could put people in touch with this if they're interested um who, who specialize in, in 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 investigating your tax claim and they charge for it, but it's, a, it's only a percentage of what they recover. And so certainly I think we, we should encourage companies to, to look at what's available to them. Um, I think finally there's, there are, and I did a bit of search on this um, uh, yesterday, on certain regions will have um, some grants for automation, in certain, in, certainly in the, uh, maybe in Wales or, or the northeast, perhaps northwest. There are where they're looking to regenerate or bring in new industry. There will be grants available, but they need a bit of searching for. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Has anyone else got anything that they'd like to add in that particular area? John. Uh, yes, just a couple of things I, I would add to what Andrew said there. The annual investment allowance is, that is an extension of an existing scheme, but the two caveats, one is that it's £1 million worth of investment, that's the ceiling if you like, on qualifying equipment of which robotic machinery is one. Um, and Simple terms, what it actually means, they're talking about 130% capital allowance of what you spend in a particular year. What it means, um, uh, the bottom line is, it, it amounts to a 25% uh, discount to your investment in a given year. And the tax relief will also be incorporated in the same 12 month period. So in other words, if you were going to spend 100,000 pounds in new machinery, then you'll get that for 75,000 pounds. So that's one thing. It doesn't apply to second-hand machinery. Um, so it's, it's to kickstart the economy. It's very interesting. It's something that uh, they implemented, I think, about four or five years ago in uh, the US. Uh, another thing that uh, Andrew did mention was grants, that you do get grants in certain areas um, of, the, of the UK, uh, but there's also certain industries there are grants available for companies that's operating, for example, within the nuclear industry. So it's always worth checking um, wherever you are in the country and depending very much on the, the market that you are in, if there is any grants available, because a grant's unlike a loan, it's somebody that's, that's giving you money. And that's what you want. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> right, okay, so something um, that, is more on the technical side again. Um, can automation introduce more manufacturing consistency to prevent accidents resulting from machine or component failure? Um, I don't know if you'd like to address that, Bill. We, over the last eight months, nine months during the COVID crisis, we've been, we've had an, a massive uplift in terms of demand for our products. We sell and manufacture respirators and associated filters for lots of companies in the UK. And we had to uh, go from, we virtually had to increase our manufacturing capability by nearly 400% uh, to meet the demand. Uh, so we did that in a number of ways. Um, so when I said we have a core people, that work for us, they are skilled people in terms of what they do and how they do that. Uh, but to bring an uplift in business to that sort of extent, we had to obviously look at the automation side in some of the cells because, uh, so otherwise we'd go from our routine reject levels and quite quickly we could sort of uh, fall off a cliff in terms of our ability to supply goods because they were not the right uh, level of performance. So introducing robotics actually enabled us to transfer the skill sets of the people who are used to doing that into machine mode and technologies and all the codes associated with programming robots. And even though we expanded significantly, sort of virtually overnight from April um, 2020, and it's still ongoing now, we did introduce a, an evening shift that, uh, to actually help us as well. It goes on till three o'clock in the morning. So the business for over, opens at six in the morning till three o'clock in the evening in the following morning. Um, and we didn't see a significant increase in rejects within say a couple of weeks of people coming in and being operational. And that's, I was astounded that we could achieve that so quickly, um, um, but uh, we did manage to achieve it. And our reject rate on our sort of our Pareto analysis, AB product lines, virtually didn't deviate. It kept going at a very, very low rate. And, uh, and we know it's right because the end of the line, we test that they are right before they go out into the marketplace. And it's all about accuracy of the robot, consistency of the robot, and the interface between the operator and the robotic cell to enable that to happen. And getting that 
uh, developed quickly um, enabled us to achieve not just the massive increase in outputs, but also uh, achieve that with no health and safety issues and also, um, you know, uh, buy-in from operators that had relatively very few skill sets to able to come in and operate these cells very, very quickly with minimal training. So for me, it was a complete success. And, you know, hopefully as we progress forward, it's going to pay its dividends as well as we move forward uh, with other products that are coming in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It would be uh, interesting to revisit at some time in the future and, and uh, you know, get an update. Um, Andrew, how about you? Um, what are your thoughts on um, um, manufacturing consistency? Um, well, we've certainly seen, I think those who, who may have driven cars from the sort of 80s, 70s, 80s, will see that the automotive industry is, is so much more reliable now. Um, nobody packs up, nobody keeps a toolkit in the car really these days. They don't expect to break down. So the quality in cars has, has been a, a massive improvement. And I think part of that could be, is down to consistency of component manufacture. Um, when I was an apprentice, uh, you're making a batch of components, you, 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 you'd get the first one signed off by an inspector. He'd come around and manually measure it. Um, but it's a bit subjective. You can squeeze a micrometer easily, 25 microns, to, to make it fit. Um, but now with, with robotics, we've got uh, better sensors. So we've got vision inspection. They can measure so much more than, than a manual inspection and they're, they're not subjective, they're consistent. So I think that, that component manufacturer improvement is, it can lead to better quality assembly and then ultimately obviously a better product. And, and on the assembly side, um, we, we now got four sense, you know, four sensors have come on leaps and bounds. And so when you're assembling component, make assembling two components or, or components into an assembly, um, feel of actually pushing a product in. I mean, if you, you've got a big enough hammer, you can make it fit. But if we're measuring the force that we need to push something into something else, you're making sure it's going to the right position at the right force, and if there is a component failure, the fact that it needs too much force or not enough will, will be identified. So that, that also checks the product. So I think the, the whole assembly techniques can be improved. Four sensors, vision sensors, I think are key to this. Um, so yes, certainly I, I think you, you've certainly seen that in, in many, um, many companies. I mean, one particular application I know um, it is an automotive industry. I think it was for a, a brake sensor um, manufacturer and they were using a, a force, uh, they were pressing with force, which was measuring position and force to make sure the component's exactly in the right place. And every product was scanned and data logged for, so eventually if there was a fault, you could to check the, the batch code for recalls purposes. So data logging is also quite important, I think, these days, certainly in key industries. Okay, thank you. Right, so I think now we're going to move on to questions that have been posed by our audience. So, first one, regarding the use of robots in dirty and dangerous production environments, this may result in robot breakdowns and lots of time spent on cleaning or moving parts. What is your opinion on this? Um, Sam, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I can take that one. Uh, maybe Jeremy would have uh, more insights than I do, but obviously if it's a difficult environment for human, it might be a difficult environment for a robot as well. So uh, temperature extremes and, and dust and, and etc. Um, but uh, the robots, some of the robots are made for that. I mean, the, the, the first application and the biggest application of robotics is still welding and it's a pretty tough environment. 
uh, and there's maintenance that come with it. But uh, if you wait the advantages and uh, the extra work required to do this, uh, the, the, there's still a, a positive balance there. Uh, but obviously, it's something that's Im important to consider when you look at an application, look at the total cost of ownership, and what are you gaining, obviously. But uh, once you adopt this new solution, what will you need to do to keep it up and running? Okay, Jeremy, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, Sam's got made a good point there that if it's a dirty and dangerous environment for a human, then it, it could be a dirty and dangerous environment for a robot. Um, and potentially you you may never see that robot again. I think one of the saddest things I ever see, saw were, were two robots dumped into a, into a nuclear uh, plant's cooling uh, uh, pond. Um, just six months after I'd spent hours installing them, it was quite a sad, sad day for me. But you, you, you know, you have to bear that in mind. But the, but the benefit of using that robot might might completely outweigh everything else, even if it lasts, you know, six months. Um, I think the other thing in there is is a lot of these robots can be designed to be really robust, um, and you can do lots of protection protection measures around those robots, and. Um, you know, the, the, the first one of the first ever microprocessor controlled robots installed back in uh, 1975 was in a grinding factory and 35 years later it was finally replaced and it was the first one of the first that were ever installed anywhere so you know back in 1975 if we could make a robot that could last 35 years in theory if you look after your robots these days they can last you know year, decades so th they can be quite robust but I think you have to bear in mind the environment they're going in and what, what that possibly might mean for its, its longevity and, and service. Thanks. Okay, so uh, next question. What should health and safety professionals be doing to make sure they can support the use and risk assessment of robots in the future? The questioner says, my impression is that occupational safety and health professionals don't have the skills needed mostly. Um, and for example, would try to apply PURE to collaborative robots. Um, is there anyone who'd like to take this question in particular? John, thank you. Um, I, would, uh, I would certainly agree with that, that um, <clears throat> when, when risking when risk assessing either an industrial robot or a collaborative robot, it's very, very unlikely that you would have um, a health and safety manager doing that. Um, there, there are a very small percentage of health and safety managers in the UK who are who come from an engineering background. So, so you need someone um, with a combination of technical expertise. They've got a knowledge of the legislation. But crucially, they also have a knowledge of the standards. That's the BSAN ISO type standards for both robots and collaborative robots, the technical reference guide. Because when you're assessing this type of machinery, that's what you're using as a benchmark to provide yourself ultimately with safety for individuals, but also a very defendable and a very robust risk assessment. So it's not, a, it's not a type of job that, that would be done by a health and safety manager, for example, it's maybe come from a, maybe a, a chemical background or, or maybe someone that's been uh, maybe working on a building site or something like that. It, it's, uh, it's something that has to be done by somebody that has the knowledge of the standards, the legislation, but has the technical expertise. And sometimes that has to be done by more than one person. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry, Andrew, go ahead. I was just going to say that it's certainly something that shouldn't really be done in isolation. I think someone's got to take responsibility for, for doing it, but they need to involve the actual people who are going to be working in, in that environment because invariably the person on shop floor knows, knows more about the job than, than or the applicant knows about the application and also possibly knows about the potential shortcuts, should I say, that, that, that people will take 
Um, so they will then you can analyze the risks. So I think it's a, someone's got to take responsibility, but it, it needs to be a bit of a, not, not a collaborative robot, a collaborative um, approach to, to applying the, site, the um, risk assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, do the panel have any examples where robots have been used for supporting testing of biological material? Anyone? Uh, yeah, um, they are being used, I think it's in Denmark for testing of COVID samples. Um, think about that particular question, but I, I don't know many more about that. It, it, um, many moons ago, there was a robot system put into a, um, a drug discovery company in, I can't remember where it was, but that was very heavily robotized, but it was mainly because, or automated rather, that was mainly because they didn't want anybody, any humans contaminating the, um, the, the samples they were gathering from all over the world of potential organic material that could actually end up being quite useful for vaccines and, and treatments. So they just didn't want any contamination in there. So uh, yes, but I, I don't know anything more than that about it. Okay, thanks. Um, back to cobots. Uh, for cobots with regards to safety, does the design process have a human reaction element added into any solutions? Uh, the question uh, says, I know of instances where the guard systems are reactionary because the assessment didn't include human error and the human cobot interface. How would this be addressed? I don't know, who would like to answer that question? Charlotte, could you, could you repeat the question again, please, if you don't mind? <laughs> it, was, it was, yeah, it was quite involved. Uh, for, go, for cobots, with regards to safety, does the design process have a human reaction element added? Um, the, the questioner is saying they know of instances where guard systems are reactionary because the assessment didn't include human error. Ah, right, okay. Um, any, any machine whatsoever, whether it be a collaborative robot, whether it be an industrial robot, whether it be a, a guillotine or a pedestal drill, it doesn't matter what it is, you always have to take into account the potential for human error and indeed uh, what you call reasonably foreseeable misuse. Uh, a collaborative robot is, is, um, is C-marked uh, against, um, or it will be C-marked in, in future for the EU countries against the, the various uh, European product directives, one of which is the machinery directive. And within the machinery directive, there is a clause that you have to meet. So it is a legal requirement that you have to take into account reasonable foreseeable misuse. Now, one, um, one thing that can help us there, certainly for collaborative robots, is to use the, the technical design standard that everybody's familiar with. Um, and uh, by benchmarking against that for power and force collaborative robots, then there is a number of threshold values that we can build in um, to the design process and indeed the, the risk assessment. But it is a good question that, because foreseeable misuse is something that always has to be taken into account. Thank you. I think I'm gonna stay here with you for a second, John. Um, yeah. There's another question. Are cobots truly CE compliant when coupled with the end of arm tooling and the product they're handling? I'm presuming, you, you know, sometimes there's um, blades for cutting, that kind of thing, or, or welding. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it, it can, it can uh, depend very much on the, the end effect. Um, when, when a company buys a collaborative robot, it's, it's already CE marked against certain European product directives. For example, they are, they are CE marked against the low voltage directive. They are also CE marked against the electromagnetic compatibility directive, but they still have to be CE marked against the machinery directive. Now that can only be done once it's programmed, it's risk assessed, and the threshold values and the speed which is extrapolated from various values has been uh, completed 
as part of the risk assessment. And what the technical reference guide clearly tells us uh, is that it depends very much on what's in what's attached to the end effector. If it's something very, very sharp, then you may have to use additional guarding. A power and force collaborative robot, for example, may need additional guarding, which could well be a combination of maybe a laser safety scanner, a pressure mat, a light barrier or something like that. But every time a collaborative robot has been risk assessed with a particular end effector, if that changes or the functionality changes, then the key thing here is that the risk assessment has got to be revisited again and documented. Charlotte, if I can uh, add to this question, John is uh, has a very uh, good expertise in this, and maybe I would just like to tie this with the pre previous question about the definition of cobots. So, definitely, everything that just said is perfectly accurate. Uh, when people buy cobots, sometimes it's not about uh, the the collaborative aspect. In fact, in many cases, they more coexist than truly collaborate. So they are there; they have their own space, and you have people on the side and the one of the big reasons why people buy these systems is because of the ease of deployment and the ease of programming and the, the fact that more people in the factories can use this system and reprogram them so in some cases and i saw another question in the chat in some cases the cobots are used just like an industrial robot so maybe the, the safety system does not allow full collaboration where people really share the same environment but the companies still get the benefit of the ease of use to automate a manual task so there's that whole spectrum of applications you can do with cobots. In all cases, you're going to need to do a risk assessment. Sometimes the risk assessment is very challenging because the use case, there's a very uh, intimate collaboration between the, the cobot and the people. Sometimes the cobot is there. Sometimes it's going to be guarded, but because it's, it's easy to use, easy to program, it still makes sense to use a cobot instead of a more traditional industrial robot. No, I was on mute then. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Um, so, right, okay, so this is um, in reference to the previous question about using robots in dirty environments. Do you think that robot shielding and robot suits or covers may possibly expand the use of industrial robot, robots not dedicated to a specific environment? Or are you for using, for example, foundry dedicated robots in a foundry environment only? Um, Jeremy, do you want to address this one? Yeah, I mean, I mean um, a lot of the manufacturers will have a foundry specification robot um, and, and they call it a foundry specification robot because originally it was designed to go in a foundry, but the reality is it, it's got a level of protection built in that allows you to use it in environments that are potentially dusty um, or potentially have um, a risk of liquid in ingress into the gearboxes and the drives and the, mo and the motors and the, and the main bodies. <clears throat> so it could be IP, you know, IP64 rated or dust, dust rated or even ATEX rated in some instances. Um, but it doesn't mean you don't have to, you, you can only use them in a foundry environment. You could use them wherever you need to use them. Um, and so um, I'm just trying to think of an example of I can, I can, in my mind, I can picture lots of foundry example robots, but I can't see where they are. That's the, um, but they definitely get used outside of that, of that those kind of area, foundry environments. Putting jackets on robots, uh, in my experience, only goes so far. Um, the great thing about an industrial robot is it has six axes. To, typically, it moves around quite a bit, um, and unfortunately, the jackets that you put around a robot tend to wear very quickly in those kind of environments. Uh, so you end up having to go back in and replace them every time, every, every time or over time. Um, but they definitely are worth doing if the environment is particularly aggressive to the um, to the robot. So um, typical, uh, typical example: shop peening. Uh, lots of lead shop flying around uh, do, for doing surface modification on on parts. Um, yeah, probably want to be protecting that robot with some sort of leather jacket. Otherwise, you're going to be stripping the robot of its paint and its and all its essential bits and pieces uh, during the process. But jackets, they, they can wear quite quickly, unfortunately. I hope, uh, hopefully I've answered that question. Okay, thank you. Um, 
We have another question here. Um, in my experience, when robots are working repetitively and correctly, safety is assured. Problems can appear when there is a fault or process variation. This creates a dynamic situation where hazards are more difficult to identify and control. What is the panel's view of this? Um, Andrew, do you want to take this one? <laughs> or not? <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, I, I don't know every brand of robots, but most will have their own self-diagnostic. So if there is a fault with the robot, um, it will have a, it will be, I mean, Jeremy might help me out on this in a bit, but uh, they will they will be wired to detect a fault in their own system. So if that was part of the question, and then invariably dual wired, so they've got redundancy in the in the system. So if it, it's got a fault, it will identify it's got a fault and then not be usable. Um, I'm not sure if that's quite answered the question, but I'm looking for Jeremy here to dig me out. Uh, yeah, I'll try and help you out there. And then, yeah, yeah, all the robot systems, um, particularly ones designed to the to the current standards, have to have this dual dual channel circuitry within them to for safety. Uh, and if that fails, then it should really send the robot into a it should should is the optimal word. It should send the robot into a uh, robot into a safe uh, state, if you like. Um, I think when you get a, a process fault, um, it's a little bit harder to detect, and quite often. Quite often what you find when you get a process fault with a robot is the robot collides with something itself or can't pick something up or some, some other unforeseen event happens and that causes the robot to stop long before it's, it started crashing through guard fences and hitting people. Um, but it, it, it comes back to that risk assessment that John was talking about. It, it's about when you're designing the system looking for every potential eventuality and trying to work out what that might be and then mitigating against that risk. There's always going to be things you can't foresee, but you, 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 you've got to do your best to find every single one that you can see. If I may add um, on this one, I, I think, Jonathan, this is not only your experience, this is actually the industry data. If you look at the accidents that happen with robots, in many cases, it's going to be in these dynamic situations that were not the intended use, for instance, during installation, or once there's a fault, the programmer needs to enter the workspace and it, it's not part of the risk assessment. So on top of the risk assessment of the cell itself, you should really think about the training of your people that will need to uh, install, uh, maintain, troubleshoot these systems uh, that can have a big impact on the safety as well. Great, thank you. Um, this one perhaps to John again, actually. Um, what are the KPIs that the HSE or any other related EU organization uh, will be considering when assessing the risks in the use of robotics? APIs. Well, <clears throat> like, like any machine, it should be treated no differently like to any other complex machine. Um, as I said earlier, it should always be benchmarked to the, the standards. So it's, not, it's not a legal requirement to do your risk assessment and benchmark to the robotic standards, but it's good practice. I, we would say it's minimum practice. But what the health and safety executive is um, what are looking for when you're doing a risk assessment uh, on any machine, including robotic machinery, is five things. This is what they say, the five steps to, to a risk assessment. The first thing is that they're looking for you to identify, the risk assessor is identifying all significant health and safety hazards. So it could be... Um, Bare cables, um, access to live parts, which can cause electrocution. It could be moving parts, which could cause um, amputation or collision or something like that. It's the hazards and the associated risks. And then the third thing they are looking for is who might be exposed. And this is a thing that a lot of people forget when they're introducing control measures as part of a risk assessment. It's who might be exposed to that uh, piece of machinery. It could be operators, it could be your maintenance people, it could be passers-by, 
It could be other people within the factory complex. It could be contractors. And then fourth of all, fourth is uh, your control measures. Number five is, is, is documented. So that's the five significant steps to risk assessment. Hazards, associated risks, who might be exposed. Number four is your control measures. And then it's documented. But we always recommend that we add a sixth one to that. Andrew mentioned earlier on there, interestingly, about consultation. We always encourage people to consult with operators and maintenance people when carrying out risk assessments because the feedback from that is um, absolutely crucial. So that's the significant things that uh, the health and safety executive is looking for. Perfect. Some good advice, I think. Right, well, we are almost out of time now. So that brings us to the end of this round table discussion. Obviously, um, there were a number of questions that were sent in that we haven't had time to address. But if you check back on the um, PPMA website, these will be addressed in the coming weeks and you'll be able to see the answers there. So all that remains for me to do is say, thank you very much to all our panelists. And before I say goodbye, um, for the audience, if you stay on screen for a moment, you'll see a link which will direct you to a survey. And we'd be really grateful if you could leave some feedback for this event. So thank you very much and goodbye.